Hi guys. So I'm Laurence Madja. I'm working for Navia. We built autonomous shuttles. Maybe you heard about us. And I'm here to present you the, the trends uh, that you can observe in ITS, Intelligent Transport System. Actually, it's a bit fake. I, I won't present this precisely, but also a kind of historical point of view of what we call today deep learning. I may not be the best, best expert on that field with you guys. So if I'm saying too many dumb things, feel free to, say, to send uh, things at the stage. So uh, it's kind of long story. Actually, we, can, we could talk about this first paper, which is actually 80 years old. And there was from work from Mike Kerak and Pitts that uh, presented uh, a kind of uh, bio jockey work. I read the paper. Okay, I didn't get anything, uh, but I had it. And what they did actually is a system systematic study of uh, an optical nerve. And they pass some electric impulses and see the response of this, uh, the fibers. And actually, I didn't get the paper, not at all. But the conclusion is really interesting. The thing is that they just concluded that what is transmitted from the eye to the brain of the frog is not the image itself, but it's rather some kind of abstract things related to the image, the edges, the curvature. The these features are globally not related to illumination, but rather to contrast. So this conclusion raised many interesting works and a lot of researchers started to work on this. And ten, we, we're talking about 1943, and maybe 10 years after that, uh, Rosenblatt presented what he called the perceptron. It was not uh, a biological study anymore, but a machine designed for image recognition and classification. So 60 years ago, he, built, he presented a machine with a camera and neuron connected randomly to four 100 pixels, a uh, small camera, and then presented an algorithm to make the system learn. So using a training database, uh, using some kind of adaption on the weights, and developing several algorithms and techniques to actually make the network learn. So it was not experimental anymore, but it's a huge step, and at that time, people were really impressed because Rosenblatt himself said that maybe this work could be designed for, uh, could be useful for universal translation. And at that time, remember the poetic contest, it was quite interesting to have this kind of work. But be because of, maybe because of it was very popular, a lot of people started working on this. And they quickly realized that there are some small issues, major issues actually, that the, this for, uh, paradigm cannot deal with non-linear problems. And in that case, you cannot do a proper work with, you, you, cannot, you only can deal with very simple uh, problems. So this book was devastating. And maybe during 10 years, 15 years, you didn't have any research on that topic. But in the 80s, some new hopes arose with the, the, the work of John Hopfield. Okay, it was kind of test using the uh, uh, retroactive neuron, but basically it was useless. But works of Yann Requin, which is famous right now, Gaginari or Hinton, were, uh, were really interesting because they, for the first time, introduced a new feature called the hidden layer. This hidden layer, technically, was the, a major step because it allowed the system to deal with non-linear separate problems. And in that case, you can now deal with many, many types of problems, classification problems. And then at that time, in the 1980, uh, 1990s, maybe, new architecture designed for specific purposes were designed. And a lot of application were designed at that time. You have biotechnology and 
AD, a DNA uh, sequencing that was historically one of the first applications. Speech recognition. Nowadays you have very powerful speech recognition systems and this part of uh, research was very active and made the, the, the field some huge progress. You have also the meteorology, but as we should see finds by money, you need money to, to work, the stock market was really, uh, gave a lot of funds to, to work on this machine learning algorithm. For a French point of view, for the French guys who are over there, you all know that kind of envelope. And you can notice over here, the orange frame over there. And this frame is really common for, us, uh, for, for French people. But actually, this system is just designed for people to write the zip code inside those frames. And using this uh, format, the post can automatically recognize and classify the, 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 the mail and this is, this is automatic. Everyone in France used this for 20 years, maybe more than 20 years. It, it works, actually. And this is based on this kind of work. So we have some habits, but recently people started to understand that you can deal with whatever problem you like with machine learning and more precisely with neural networks. But to do so, you just have to increase again and again the number of layers in your architecture. And then new software were designed, new platforms. Uh, some people talked about TensorFlow, Cafe, or other systems, softwares. And these softwares um, pushed the need of new layers. New layers coding new features. And what is fascinating over here is that the features that are now developed and in, in integrated within those software are totally the same that were described by McCurk and Pitts 80 years ago. The edges, the curvature, and all that stuff is directly inspired by those authors. So now we have many tools. We have several models to run, and we can do whatever we like depending on the problem we have. Many applications can be imagined, but there are still two limitations, many limitations, but mainly two of them. First one, st first, first one is the computing power. As I would say before, you cannot deploy easily uh, these deep networks. And the second one is to have a database, a training set, and with actual truth, the annotated training set, and this is this seems quite simple, but it induced a lot of new trends. So first of all, the GPU. In the first place, it was designed for, game, for computer graphics. And those systems presented new architecture, massively parallel, in order to, to, build, to make some simple but very rough computations, just like displaying triangles, vertices. And NVIDIA, first of all, uh, started to understand that, research in the first place, started to understand that the huge architecture that was designed cannot be run on CPU. So they decided to test on GPU. And that was it. Big players understood the potential market, and then they started to design GPUs related to this. So NVIDIA, in the first place, uh, Google built some TPUs for dedicated for TensorFlow. AMD uh, with, with Intel. I recently read that Intel will set a partnership with AMD, which is mad to me, uh, in order to integrate their GPUs. So the, the computing power, you can get it. But those kind of systems cannot be ins easily installed on, autom on, on vehicles. And this is my job, actually. So I have to take care of this. So we'll see how it can be done right now. The first, this, the f this first point was the computing power. So let's assume I have a huge Titan X in my trunk, in my car. And now what do I need X? I need a training base 
to make my network run. It has to be trained. So how can I do this? Okay, I'm a former, I'm a former public researcher, so I, hmm, maybe I could download a public database. Okay, I'm promise. I won't use this in production. I, I, I'm not allowed to. So I won't do this. So how can I get the, this huge annotated data I need, I mean, I, I need sorry, for, for training my, my, my network? I can call a company. Many companies recently arose providing annotation services. And this is really interesting because those companies didn't exist five years ago because the need didn't exist. So this new need is really creative of new companies. So you can have um, the mechan some specific companies, just like the right, mighty.ai, or you can also use Amazon Mechanical Turk services. You can, you can make money, actually, if you want to annotate images. But the thing is that in that war, that war, the, the, main, the main resource gets, becomes the data. We need annotated data. And I'm not within the big four. I don't have any, any huge database. And if I want to, do, to have a huge database, that could take for decades. And these four, big four, are helped by you, guys. Because any time you say to Facebook, hey, look at that picture, I'm on it. And this is my sister over there. I know that my sister is there. And you can say, okay, this picture, on that picture I have myself, I have my sister, I have my wife, I have my kids, I don't know. And you help these big four to make their annotated databases. You help Google to increase Street View when you're doing some capture. You help uh, Google Earth when you're using SketchUp to build 3D buildings. I did it, personally. I may have maybe three buildings in South uh, Australia, I guess. So the crowdsourcing, it may be the best option to date to get the huge database we need. So now we have the computing power. We have the huge databases. So what can be done with this kind of application? You all know the applications that can be performed. So as I said, speech language recognition is now very efficient. You have all this in your packet within your phone. You all have this kind of system with the automatic um, typer. And when it's trained to you, it's particularly effective. You also have some video system, video recognition for interaction, some just like of gender, age, attitude, determination. I'm sad, I'm old, I'm half a bed, I don't know. Yes, that's true. Uh, you can also make some object detection, just like Shark presented just before me. Uh, to, so you have detection and segmentation. He just explained the difference, so I won't, I won't uh, insist on this. But this work is really interesting to us, particularly for autonomous driving. But I don't know if you know that project. It's really interesting. It's called BabyX. It's from a, a, a university in New Zealand. A uh, company called Soul Machine. And it's really, it's a bit scary, actually. You, you can see the, the, the reactions of a small child when submitted to external um, solicitations. So it's video, it's audio, it's, I don't know, other sensors I cannot Im even imagine. But it's really scary. So let's back, go, go, let's go back to, let's go to the in automotive industry. We know that those systems, those deep learning systems can help us to detect objects and to perceive what sits around us. But historically, to date, to me anyway, MobileEye is the first and only actual ADA, uh, ADA Advanced Driver Assistant. You may have heard about MobileEye. Yeah, you did, actually. 15 billion buyout. 15 billion, guys, by Intel, three, three months ago. So to be honest, I'm not sure they use a uh, deep learning technique. I'm pretty sure they don't, actually. But they provide, using old-fashioned techniques, image processing techniques, they provide information to the environment for the driver. 
But recently, at CES, for example, uh, which was very oriented towards autonomous vehicles, um, at CES, new players presented very interesting stuff, just like AI Motive, for example, only based on deep learning with a big, huge computer in the trunk. And they, they have very interesting results. Stereo vision without two cameras. Wow. And you have also big players, just like NVIDIA, which presented its autonomous car uh, just by a simple association from the steering angle to the image. When you see that image, you have to steer like this. Okay, it's kind of approach. But the thing is that this, this system, a demo system, the, you cannot use them in production. There are huge computer in the trunk, so you cannot do this. Instead, you have to wait, because I don't want to make a demo car. I want my shuttle to be autonomous, and I want my shuttle to have people inside. So I don't want to have a big computer within it. So I need automotive-grade systems to comply with the automotive certification, which are very strict, because when you run a car, you cannot do whatever you like. So I just try to wait a bit, because in one year, I will have um, GPUs, annotation services company, and now, what, can, what, is, what is being done in Navia? So in Navia, we already mastering, mastering the whole fashion techniques, image processing, mm, road marking detection and feeding to uh, keep your gain. <coughs> Stereo vision for obstacle detection, quite basic stuff. Coro images to detect traffic lights and analyze traffic lights. And we are currently integrating the, right, the latest deepest algorithm by fuzzing the rider and the uh, image, by detecting image using deep learning techniques, de using NVIDIA platforms. And we have to be up to date, but in the same time, we have to maintain our automotive certification. But when we have some GPUs very powerful and automotive grades, even when we, have, when we have some complex model, we just have to keep in mind one thing. The thing is that driving a car is way more complicated than just saying there is obstacle over there, obstacle over there. Let's imagine how many processes are involved when you, cross, when you want to cross a crowded place. There are a lot of phenomenon, a lot of things. How I'm educated, my training, my mood, the people around me, the flow, the, the way they move around me, the way they look like. Maybe this person, are we let, he, let him go, but another one, are we passing in front of him? So it's way more that complicated than just building driving monkeys. You just have to see the things at a more higher level. And we are the users of <laughs> your works, guys. So uh, we can't really on you to make forward the, the research and imagine very complex things. Thank you. Yeah.